O oh, all the links where I he golfed, fra Ayr to Aberdeen, on Prestwick or Carnoustie, and mony mere a ween. What though the bents are rough and bunkers yon a roon, I dearly loo to play the breezy links so troon. On Scotland's blustery Ayrshire coast lies the town of Troon, home to one of the most testing golf links in the world and the venue for the 126th Open Championship. Royal Troon Golf Club's motto, as much by skill as by strength, could hardly be more appropriate for a course containing both the longest and the shortest holes on the championship rotor. Since 1878, its charms and dangers have tested the skill and fortitude of its members. And since 1923, it has drawn the world's finest players in their quest to win the oldest and greatest of golf's prizes. That year, Englishman Arthur Havers won Troon's first Open. In 1950, South Africa's Bobby Locke laid claim to the Open title. And 12 years later, the incomparable Arnold Palmer held aloft the claret jug outside the Granite Clubhouse. In 1973, the graceful Tom Weiskopf continued the American love affair with Troon. That would be his only major title. Not so five times Open champion Tom Watson, the winner in 1982. The victor in 1989, Mark Kalkavecchia, has returned this year along with the unmistakable figure of the great Watson. The reigning champion, Tom Lehman, arrived in top form, as did former winners Nick Price and Greg Norman. The US Open champion, Ernie Els, was amongst the favorites, while the home challenge was led by Colin Montgomery and Nick Faldo. And the greatest of them all, the peerless Jack Nicklaus, now 57 years old, but with his competitive fire burning as fiercely as ever. My biggest problem was my body being able to, being able to uh, uh, get loose enough to play in cool, cool weather. And uh, uh, if that works, then uh, you know, I, should, I should be all right. But uh, uh, obviously, I'm not going to do what I used to do as far as competition. But uh, uh, you know, I might scare him a little bit like I did last year for a couple of rounds. When the last Open was held at Troon in 1989, a 14-year-old California boy had dreamed of following in the footsteps of his hero. Now, eight years later, the boy has become a man and the dream has become something more than a teenage fantasy. In April at the Masters, in his first major as a professional, he had stunned the watching world, demolishing the Augusta course and the rest of the field to win by 12 strokes and become the youngest winner of the green jacket. The tiger mania that has exploded in the USA has proceeded towards the Ayrshire coast. But for the man himself, the open galleries provided a welcome change from life on the US tour. So we say, uh, it's no, now it's not the time for autographs or anything like that. You know, please wait till later. And they accept it. And that's been awfully nice. And I noticed that they don't cheer for uh, shots that just get airborne here. <laughs> Tom Lehman's long path to success could hardly have been more different to the meteoric rise of Tiger Woods. And many were reserving judgment on the young superstar's ability to deal with the demands of Lynx golf. But the Open Championship is not the exclusive reserve of household names. Watched by his father, who's also his caddy, 20-year-old English amateur champion Sean Webster had been drawn to hit the opening shot of the championship. It would just be like any other shot, like, you know, just try and get it down the middle of the fairway, but I guess there will be a bit of added pressure. Both the stars and the relative unknowns would find the course in perfect condition for the opening day's play. After months of preparation, the Royal Troon Lynx was ready to play her part in the unfolding drama of the 126th Open Championship.
The opening day of the championship dawned cold and gray on the Ayrshire coast. After a surprisingly good night's sleep, Sean Webster set off at 5.30 a.m. for the most important day of his golfing life. Bye. See you guys. Despite the early hour and the chilly wind, an air of suppressed excitement is building at Royal Troon as the 7.15 start time draws ever closer. Yeah, it should be fun. Hopefully the weather will keep up. It's a bit dodgy at the moment, isn't it? A bit of wind keeps it interesting. <laughs> Most golfers, from high handicappers to hardened professionals, have suffered first tee nerves. But when you're just 20 years old, playing in your first Open, hitting the opening drive of the championship and are being watched by more people than you could ever have imagined, you have every right to feel nervous, even if you don't show it. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I welcome you to Royal Troon Golf Club for the first day's play of the 126 Open Championship. This is game number one on the tee, Sean Webster. Beautiful drive of nearly 300 yards to the middle of the fairway, and the 126th Open is underway. Lynx golf can be a cruel mistress, but Royal Troon's opening hole named Seal was in the mood to bestow favors on her first visitor. A fortuitous bounce setting up a four-foot birdie chance. A spurned gift and par at the first. 155 players would follow Sean Webster around the Royal Troon links during an opening day that would test the mettle of the world's greatest golfers. Ayrshire folk might smile and tell you it was little more than a breeze. But the chill northwesterly that blew off the Firth of Clyde was turning a round of golf at Royal Troon into a test of survival. Ladies and gentlemen, this is game number 36 on the team, Tiger Woods. For Tiger Woods, the moment of truth has arrived. It had been suggested that the fearsome length off the tee that had tamed Augusta could also conquer Troon. But the opening hole was to provide a sobering reminder that Lynx golf requires both power and accuracy. A hard-fought par at the start of a round that would test Wood's character as much as his ability. A triple bogey seven at the railway hole was the lowest point of the round, but Woods was saving the best till last. A 
marvelous approach to the 18th set up a rare birdie chance. A day of fluctuating fortunes had produced a one-over par round of 72. But at the end of it all, had he enjoyed it? <laughs> she would have asked me after 11. I would have given you a different answer than I'm going to give you right now. But um, no, all together, shooting a 72 under these conditions, it's, it's not bad at all. And especially with a 7 on the card, uh, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> Less happy was the man carrying Scotland's hopes of open victory. As the wind continued to blow and the galleries continued to shiver, Colin Montgomery's challenge faltered over the easier front nine before crumbling on a back nine made brutally long by the wind. At the end of another frustrating opening day for Montgomery at the Open Championship, his hopes seemed buried in the rough as he struggled to a five over par round of 76. In better spirits was Royal Troon's champion of eight years earlier. Mark Kalkavecchia arrived at the 1989 Open as an outsider to lift the claret jug. But in a four-hole playoff with Greg Norman and Wayne Grady, he produced the shot of the tournament at the 18th hole to confirm his victory. The experience of that summer's afternoon remains Mark Kalkavecchia's most treasured golfing memory. I did come back a couple times uh, in between then, so, you know, to, to play the golf course and uh, kind of relive it a little bit. So I got all the uh, past memories out of the way. But yeah, I, I just like to be playing late Sunday afternoon. You know, I'd like to. It'd be uh, it'd be a lot of fun to have a chance to win this tournament again uh, on the back nine to see how I do, and uh, you know that's that's why I'm here. Kalkavecchia's opening round summed up his fortune since winning in 89. A lot of good work undone by some poor putting all added up to a frustrating round of 74. Argentina's Eduardo Romero finished on the same score and would hover on the periphery of the leaderboard throughout the week, thanks in part to some stunning recovery shots. As day one wore on, the wind continued to blow. With a following breeze, American Tommy Tollis was one of several players to drive the green at the 364-yard first hole, though he was the only man to claim an eagle there. That, however, was the highlight of a six-over par total of 77. It was another young American player who caught the eye on the first day. Texan Justin Leonard negotiated the back nine brilliantly to finish on two under par. Nick Faldo had an even par round of 71, which, with a little luck, could have been even better. On the 18th green, Jesper Panovic's reaction told the whole story. Birdie for a round of 70, one under par. As the afternoon grew warmer, it was an Irishman who began to enjoy the sunshine. Darren Clark's birdie at the 11th set him on the way to a four under par total of 67 and a share of the lead with American Jim Furrick. I stood on the 10th tee and thought if I can shoot par from here, I'll be happy, which I managed to do. Ah, fantastic. Uh, you know, to come here and play, play as well as I did today and uh, see me on top of the leaderboard's great. At the end of a difficult day, only 10 men were able to break par with Clark and Furrick finishing two shots clear of Couples, Leonard and Norman. For those spectators with enough staying power to make it to the evening, there was a late treat as Pierre Fulker brought the day to a close with a beautifully judged shot at the 14th.
If the greatest players in world golf aren't enough to keep you interested at Troon, the tented village offers visitors the chance to brush up on their computer skills on the open website, to brush up on their golf skills at the PGA Teaching Center, or simply to brush up on their shopping skills in the Aladdin's cave of the merchandise tent. Day two had bathed Royal Troon in warm sunshine, and smiles had replaced shivers on the faces of the spectators and most of the players. Darren Clark was out early and showing himself to be as adept in the calm conditions as he was in the wind the day before. Having gone out in 32 strokes, Clark again played the back nine brilliantly. His approach to the par 5 16th set up a birdie chance, which would take him to nine under par. Pars at the final two holes meant a round of 66 and the lead in the clubhouse. Stay Having negotiated the front nine in level par, Tiger Woods' approach shot at the par four tenth was about to put him in trouble. Having already failed to move the ball, this was now his fourth shot. With his frustration apparent, Wood's next shot ran across the green. The result, a four over par eight, and a danger that he would miss the cut. No such worries for Sweden's Jesper Panovic, despite a wayward drive at the 18th. Out in 33, he needed to get down in three from here for a 66, and third place on the leaderboard. of the day, and a two-round score of seven under. By the time Tiger Woods reached the 18th, he was in real danger of missing the cut, predicted at five over par. On the green in two, however, he had a chance to make sure with a birdie putt. Despite the 13 shots between himself and Darren Clark, Woods was still in no mood to surrender. If I can play a good round tomorrow, good solid run, uh, maybe get off to the start I would like to get off to, uh, and then keep it going, uh, who knows what can happen. By the end of day two, Scotland's Barclay Howard had already secured the cherished silver medal awarded to the leading amateur. With rounds of 70 and 74, he was the only non-professional player to make the cut. Sean Webster, the man who had hit the opening drive of the championship, failed to make it. But he's hoping to return to the Open as a professional. Yeah, I've got a few tournaments, amateur tournaments to play in um, before the year's up, but then I think I'm going to go to tour school at the end of the year and uh, give it a shot and try and, uh, try and get my tour card. and. Uh, Make him a living. Colin Montgomery has made a handsome living from his tour card, but so far major success has eluded him. If he was to challenge at Royal Troon, where his father is the club secretary, he desperately needed a subpar round. <laughs> Thank you.
A birdie at the second was followed by a bogey at three. Birdies at four and five, and this eagle opportunity at six. Out in five under par, things were looking good for Monty. And then he hit the back nine. By the time he reached the 18th, Montgomery needed this putt to stay at three over for the championship. A good end to the round, but not quite good enough to put him within striking distance of the leaders. Fred Couples has long been a crowd favorite at the Open, and his second day 68 kept him on the leaderboard, four shots behind Darren Clark. But it was again Justin Leonard who led the American challenge. The 1992 US amateur champion was accepting both the good and bad bounces with equanimity. And when Royal Troon offered him an unexpected opportunity for a birdie, he was quick to accept. It's nice and warm and, and not as breezy as yesterday. So, um, you know, I felt like going, going out there, if, if I felt good and, and comfortable, um, you know, I can maybe try to attack a little more and, uh, you know, see what came of it. Joining Leonard, Parnovic and Clark with rounds of 66, England's David Tapping forced his way onto the leaderboard late in the day with some sparkling golf. But after two days of very different weather at Troon, Darren Clark led by two strokes from Justin Leonard, with Jesper Parnovic one shot further back in third position. While the leaders were looking forward to the final two days, many famous names were preparing to bid farewell to the Open. Severiano Ballesteros needed this part of the 18th to make the cut. Three-time winner joined former champions Sandy Lyle, Ian Baker Finch, Nick Price, and Gary Player on the list of casualties. The final match of the day also saw the end for India's first ever open competitor. Though he had previously beaten Colin Montgomery in a Dunhill Cup match, Gurav Gai had found the championship a daunting experience. It's not very easy to go out there and uh, keep everything you know, out of your mind and just concentrate on the golf. Because you have, I mean, I've never seen so many people on a golf course before, so it is tough. It is difficult, but I thought I handled it pretty well yesterday till, till I got to the back nine. <laughs> and then it was just really tough. 20 over par. But for India's pioneering golfer, two days he will never forget. You don't want to be taping me the way I'm playing. <laughs> Glorious sunshine that followed day one had helped to attract record crowds to Royal Troon. So had the Royal and Ancient's new policy of free admission to the championship for under 18s. For RDA's secretary, Michael Bonalek, it was part of an ongoing commitment to junior golf. Our committee thought that this was a good way of getting them to be able to see uh, good golf played by the best players in the world without any cost to themselves. Oh, it's been a great experience. You see them out on the course watching uh, these players, and then they go into the golf show, uh, into the PGA Improvement Center, and they're queuing up there to have lessons. And uh, they're trying to copy the Faldos and the Tiger Woods and the Jack Nicklauses and all these good players that are watching. The fairways are extremely dry here at the Open today. The junior visitors repaid the R&A's gesture with exemplary behavior, both in the tented village 
and on the course. Good play on that one. Very good shot. But juniors weren't the only special guests at the championship. His Royal Highness, the Duke of York, a member of the r and and an accomplished player, was on hand to witness Tiger Woods in action. Yeah. And he was treated to some majestic golf. With birdies at five of the first nine holes, Woods reached the turn in 32. But even that didn't prepare the gallery or the TV commentators for what was to come. Well, Woods here at 16 has got uh... Well, 290 yards to the flag. He's not going to get there today, but he's giving it a go. And he's hit the most enormous shot. <laughs> That's absolutely extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. An eagle at the 16th was followed by an unorthodox birdie at 17. At the 18th, the Tiger now needed par to equal Greg Norman's record of 64 for the lowest ever round at Royal Troon, although the Australians was achieved in 1989 when the Lynx par was 72, rather than the current par 71. Woods now needed this putt for a stunning round of 64 to take him to three under par. To, uh, this is a Tiger as a, as a course record equaling round. Well, no, it equals it equals the course record total. I mean, it was a 64, as I say. But, but the club, I think, have always viewed that the 64 of Greg Norman was the course record. I've done open before. Uh, I've gone back to Lidham. For the last 16 years, the Championship's press officer David Begg has been meeting the needs of the world's media. The 126th Open will be his last in charge of the press tent. And in that time, he has come face to face with both the joy of victory and the despair of defeat. It's been a wonderful time. You think of the champions and you think of moments of triumph and you think of every single one in that moment. You also think of moments of disappointment and you think of the sorrow of the player who's second and all of those stand out in my mind. We're going to miss him. He's, been, he's run that uh, press uh, interview area and the press office. He's done a great job. Uh, what more can I say? You know, I think he's... Uh, he's certainly, uh, I've, I've been happy to know him, the man, over the last 15, 16 years. David has gone through the whole, whole gamut with me. He's seen me play, uh, gone from, go from a young man to an old man, as I guess the two of us have done together. While the news of Tiger Woods' round was making the early headlines, out on the course, the third round was beginning to heat up. Tom Watson, Seeking to equal Harry Varden's record of six open victories, made steady progress with a round of 70 to go two under. <laughs> Fellow American Jim Furyk's challenge began to waver, and he had to rely on some inspired putting for a round of 70 to put him at four under for the championship. While Furek struggled in the heat, Jesper Parnovic was putting together the round of the day. Having birdied the first two holes for an outward nine of 33, his approach play saw him safely through the treacherous ninth, 10th and 11th holes. But playing partner Fred Couples was also maintaining his challenge in spectacular fashion. That eagle at the 11th took him to seven under, though he would finish the day at six under. At the par 5 16th, Parnovic's approach set up an eagle putt. The Swede was playing beautifully, and at the next hole, the par 3 17th, he continued his charge.
Yes, Jasper. Go for it, son. Go on, son. Another fine tee shot, another birdie, and a round of 66 to take him 11 under for the championship. While Parnovic was enjoying his round in the sun, the second round leader, Darren Clark, had moved to 12 under. But his driving throughout the round had been erratic, and he was having to scramble too often to save par. Clark's partner, Justin Leonard, was playing with more assurance than the Irishman from the tee, but the Royal Troon Greens were withholding any favours from the 25-year-old Texan. <laughs> Clark at the 12th had another tricky putt for par. But the pressure was beginning to tell on Clark's long game, which had looked so solid over the two opening days. Yeah, <laughs> a back nine of 39 and a round of 71 for Clark. For Leonard, a rare long putt at the 16th, but a disappointing round of 72 that would leave him with a mountain to climb on the final day. For Darren Clark, the prospect of a final day pairing with the new championship leader, Jesper Parnovic. Fred Couples' round of 70 left him tied with Leonard at six under. Having played beautifully for his round of 66, Parnovic felt that his game was in good enough shape to spend the evening with his family. Leonard and Clark headed to the practice tee to work on the problems that had beset their rounds. I've been driving the ball not, not as good as I'd like all week, uh, leaking a lot to the right, and you know, um, I just went a little bit further today in the marriage around the back nine, but uh, a little bit of work there, and hopefully I'll be a bit better off tomorrow. As day three drew to a close, the last man on the practice ground was showing his young fans that record rounds require both talent and hard work. Though even Tigers need a little relaxation. It's 4.30 a.m. on the final day of the championship. And this morning, just as they have done throughout the tournament, Royal Troon's green staff are grooming the links to perfection. Each day's pin positions are determined by the championship committee, and precise measurements are required to ensure that the holes are cut in exactly the right place. The world's finest players expect and are given perfection. Tiger Woods was to challenge for the lead. He needed to get off to a flying start. With birdies at the fourth and fifth holes, he moved to five under par. But still ahead of him lay Royal Troon's eighth, the postage stamp. At just 126 yards, it ought to be a simple prospect, but with cavernous bunkers all around and a narrow sloping green, there is precious little room for error.
a triple bogey six, and Tiger's dream of open victory is over. The American challenge now rested with the penultimate pairing of the day. Justin Leonard laid five shots off the lead, but his golf had been impressive throughout the week. A fine drive at the first left him with a short pitch to the green. On the tee, Fred Couples. Fred Couples, also at six under, was looking for a quick start to launch his challenge. And a massive drive left him two putts for a birdie, which he gratefully accepted. Leonard needed this for par to remain at six under. The overnight leader was in buoyant mood as he prepared to face the most important 18 holes of his career. Nicknamed Spaceman for his lifestyle, which includes alternative medicine and meditation, Jesper Parnovic's amiable character has made him a favorite of the galleries at Royal Troon. While playing partner and closest rival Darren Clark arrived via the back door, Parnovic was prepared to face the pressure that often accompanies the tournament leader, as well as the burden of his own open experience. At the 1994 championship at Turnberry, just a few miles south of Troon, Parnovic had made a fatal mistake at the 18th, risking a direct shot at the flag, when a safer shot to the heart of the green would have, at worst, put him into a playoff. The hollow where the ball landed became known as Jesper's Grave, as Nick Price came from behind to snatch the title. On the first tee at Royal Troon, Parnovic decided to play safe. His iron shot put him on the fairway with a long approach shot to the green. A pulled shot, a greenside bunker, and exactly the start he wanted to avoid. But Parnovic is renowned as a fighter, and his shot from the bunker was sensational. A scrambled par, but a less than comfortable opening hole for the Swede. A long drive by Clark had set up a birdie opportunity and the chance to apply some pressure to Parnovic. A perfect start for the Irishman. But on the second tee, he was to play a shot that even he was unable to explain. Taking an iron for safety, he shanked his ball onto the beach and out of bounds for a two-stroke penalty. His third shot from the tee found a fairway bunker, and the Irishman was in deep, deep trouble. A glorious recovery, but a double bogey six to take him back to eight under. But at the third, he showed that his challenge was far from over. If Clark was throwing down the gauntlet, Parnovic was more than happy to pick it up. For both men, a golden opportunity for a birdie three. Oh. Parnovic was to make no such mistake with his tap-in, but up ahead, Justin Leonard was also beginning to play some sparkling golf. A 
birdie at the seventh moved him to ten under and into second place on the leaderboard. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the par 5 6, Parnovic was beginning to feel the pressure. The hole, named Turnberry, may or may not have revived memories of his heartbreak of three years earlier, but the Swede was gripped by indecision as to which club to use for his fourth shot. Finally, still well short of a green, he elected to use his putter. With his approach putt woefully short, Parnovic had to settle for a bogey at a hole that most players had seen as a birdie opportunity. Clark on the green in three made no such mistake. That birdie put the Irishman to nine under and back within striking distance of both Leonard and Parnovic. With Leonard having safely negotiated the postage stamp in par, it was now the turn of Clark and Parnovic. With Clark safely on the green for a comfortable par, Parnovic was now in serious danger of surrendering his lead. Another test of character for Parnovic. But with the fearsome back nine looming, his nerve and resilience had already been put under serious strain. While the leaders prepared for the final act, others were exiting the open stage. Disappointment again for Scotland's Colin Montgomery, but a week in which he had enjoyed tremendous support from the galleries at Troon. Tom Watson is widely regarded as an honorary Scotsman. With this birdie at the 18th, he finished on two under par, but is still in search of that elusive sixth open title. A late charge by Ireland's Porig Harrington, including this eagle at the 16th, took him to four under par and a share of fifth place. Finishing one shot ahead at five under was Jim Furrick, a constant presence on the leaderboard throughout the week. <laughs> Having bogeyed the 10th hole to move back to 10 under par, Justin Leonard had another testing putt to save par at the 11th. Way to go. Thank you. Parnovic had also dropped a shot at the 10th, but his approach shot to the railway hole had given him a chance to make amends with a birdie putt. Yeah! Short of the green at the 13th, Parnovic needed to get down in two to maintain his two-shot lead over Leonard. Oh. Yes! With his lead now down to just one shot, Parnovic would have to call on all his reserves of strength and character. But at the 15th hole, Leonard was undergoing his own test of character. His ball had come to rest between the feet of a course marshal, but had moved from its landing position. Yep, yep. pick the ball up. Okay. Now I can place it because we know exactly where it was. Correct. Yep. 
With the rules correctly applied, Leonard now needed to get down in two to save power. Beneath Leonard's gracious demeanor, a ferocious competitor was beginning to show his face, and the Troon galleries were warming to him. One shot behind Parnovic after 15 holes, he arrived at the 16th green with a chance to draw level for the first time in the championship. Eleven under, joint leader, and seemingly with ice in his veins, the balance of power had shifted to the young American. But Parnovic still had to play the par 5 16th, a hole he had birdied on the previous three days. But as Parnovic's ball settled five feet from the flag for a birdie putt, ahead on the par 3 17th, Leonard had played to the back of the green and left himself with a long birdie putt to take a one-stroke lead. As Parnovic measured the putt he needed to draw level, Leonard watched from the 18th tee. stroke that had served him so loyally for three days had now deserted Panovic when he needed it most. One stroke behind with two to play, the ghosts of Turnberry had returned. But Leonard still needed to hold his game together on an 18th hole that had destroyed the open ambitions of many great players before him. Another fine drive and another turn of the screw on Parnovic, who now needed to produce something special at the par 3 17th. For the Swede, the disappointed silence which greeted his shot was deafening. For Leonard, about to play his approach to the 18th, it was further confirmation that he was now in control of his own destiny. With Leonard safely on the green, Parnovic now needed to birdie at least one of the last two holes to force a playoff. Parnovic, shoulders slumped, was now sadly wearing the look of a defeated man as Leonard made his way to the final green.
Another bogey, a two-shot deficit, and Leonard now had one hand on the old claret jug. An outstanding final round of 65 for a 12 under par total of 272. And just a few moments to wait until his confirmation as open champion. Pandevic now needed to hold his second shot to force a playoff. moment of joy for Justin Leonard as the gallery surrounding the 18th hole provided a standing ovation for the final pair. For Darren Clark, already resigned to the fact that this would not be his day, smiles and laughter. For Jesper Panovic, each heartfelt cry of sympathy was a bitter reminder of how close he had come once again to the greatest prize in golf. The demands of the championship can be unremittingly cruel, and for Parnovic and his family, the suffering continued. Another bogey, and a chance for Darren Clark to join Parnovic in second place. As preparations for the prize ceremony began, Darren Clark and Justin Leonard were able to enjoy their achievements. For Parnovic, impossible. <laughs> At the end of four days, the Open had a new and most worthy champion. And the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer for the year with a score of 272, Justin Leonard. Posed and emotionless on the course, the champion's gracious victory speech was to reveal another side to his character. I need a few notes. As some of you know, uh, I'm here alone this week. It's just myself and my caddy, Bob Reifke. I think it just hit me. Come back, come on. Legs. Watch, come on back, boys. Back. Back. It has been said by many champions that they remember little of the minutes and hours following victory as the crowds of well wishers and the emotions of the moment swirl all around them. But as Justin Leonard made his way to a celebration with the members of the Royal and Ancient, the 1997 Open champion was beginning to reflect on four days that he will never forget. People wanted to see a close finish, and uh, so they were pulling for me, and 
and uh, you know it's just a wonderful experience all week with the galleries here and 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 they're so appreciative of, of good golf shots and it, it really doesn't matter where you're from and and I think that's what this game should be all about you know it, it's been a great week and, and obviously an incredible day today and uh, you know I just I, I look forward to, to when this starts to sink in